All right, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the March 15th edition of the Polyplity webinar. Uh, today we have uh, uh, two uh, great talks uh, from two students um, uh, speaking to us about uh, polyplity and adaptation. Uh, up first is uh, Magdalena Buhunzitska. Uh, she is a, a final year in her last year of her PhD at Charles University, uh, working with uh, Philip Kolar and Levi Yant. And her thesis topic is how predictable is genome evolution insights from parallel adaptations across the Brassicaceae. Uh, and she's going to tell us a little bit about that today in her talk uh, titled genomic novelty and process level convergence and adaptation to whole genome duplication. With that, I'm going to let Magdalena take, take it away. Uh, and uh, we'll be back up at the end and, and have some questions then uh, before our, our next talk. All right, go ahead, Magdalena. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mike. And thank you for the introduction and also for organizing this polyploid webinar. It's really cool. And today I want to speak here about the convergence in adaptation to whole genome duplication. And many of you here uh, certainly know that the whole genome duplication, which leads to auto polyploidy, looks like a promising mutation. Uh, we have some evidence about it coming from the fact that Many of the crop species are polyploid, also invasive species are polyploid, and polyploids are known to often colonize challenging environments. Whether this is really so, and whether the autopolyploidy indeed brings some adaptive advantage, still remains to be established, and there is a project about it running in our group of Philip Collard. Um, but today I want to talk about a different aspect of autopolyploidy, and that's the fact that after the polyploid originates, it's quite a big mutation to deal with. Um, it has twice as many chromosomes as its diploid progenitor, so there is the need to stabilize meiosis, uh, cell cycle regulation, also, there is changed cell size to volume ratio and altered ion homeostasis. And, and in order for the new polyploid to maybe enjoy the possible advantages of being a polyploid, it first has to adapt. And the adaptation to genome duplication was studied in Arabidopsis arenosa which is a diploid and tetraploid species complex. Um, the tetraploids originated around 20,000 generations ago and then sp uh, spread it successfully. As you can see here, the blue are tetraploids all over here in Europe and uh, red are diploids. And the tetraploids are fully fertile and genetically variable. So it really looks that they successfully adapted. And uh, the genomic basis of this adaptation was studied by Rivayan and then by us. Uh, we sequenced the genomes of diploids and tetraploids and searched for excess differentiation between, between them. And this excess differentiation, this is an example of a one low psi showing this differentiation, the peak here, would be a signature of positive, positive selection associated to whole genome duplication. And actually in Arenosa, the best hits, uh, the best candidates for selection were all co-interacting uh, meiosis genes responsible for chromosome pairing and crossover formation during meiosis. Um, and because meiosis is quite conserved cellular process, uh, there was the idea that, and, and also the signatures were very clear, that this solution actually might be repeated, might be somehow a principal solution to whole genome duplication. And this was uh, an idea of Levi Yan's project, which I joined. Um, and first, we look into the uh, convergence between Arabidopsis arenosa and Arabidopsis lirata, which is a sister species diverged around half a million years ago. And similarly to Arenosa, Lirata is uh, the tetraploids of Lirata are genetically variable and fertile. And once we scanned for the signatures of selection, 
we again identify the same set of genes being responsible for crossover uh, in meiosis. So this looked as a really nice uh, example of uh, um, similarity in adaptation to whole genome duplication. But then these two adaptation events were not entirely independent. Um, once we looked into the structure of both species, uh, these are uh, Lirata diploids and these are Arenosa diploids. And you can see they are uh, clear distinct groups. But then if we looked into tetraploids um, here, probably you have the gray thing there, but you could see that they form a hybrid zone. Uh, the species broke down their species barriers at the tetraploid state and can exchange alleles. And actually all these alleles uh, involved in adaptation of meiosis were introgressed between the species by adaptive gene flow. Um, so there was a um, question coming from this observation what if we take a fully independent system, which would be far, uh, far enough from them uh, not to share any, not to be able to share any alleles? Would this clear solution be repeated? And our hypothesis behind this was, well, given uh, that um, the adaptation target the same uh, well-defined genes in Arenosa and Lirata, and these genes uh, are responsible for a conserved cellular process. Uh, this adaptation would likely be repeated also in other uh, more diverged species. And this would bring a cool case of convergence in a conserved cellular process. We took Cardamine Amara as the independent system which is 17 million years diverged from both Arenosa and Lirata. But it shares a very similar distribution range. And similarly to them, um, a previous study established that the tetraploids are diverse, and uh, diverse, genetically diverse, and likely form a single lineage, which likely established during around the glacial oscillation in Europe. So again, this would be comparable to Arenosa and Lirata. So to start, we sampled a uh, whole genome resequenced two diploid and two tetraploid populations away from the contact zone, which go, uh, goes through the Czech Republic. And we also assembled a diploid reference genome from an individual from this population loss. And this was a collaborative project and all credit for this goes to these amazing people here. And then we looked for the population genetic structure in this data set. And both PCA and Tremix graph shows a clear um, a clustering of tetraploids. This is also in agreement with the differentiation, which was lowest between the two tetraploids. Um, you can see here in comparison to tetraploid diploid and diploid diploid contrast. Um, and it provides an evidence for a single origin of, of the tetraploids, at least of those uh, selected by us. And this knowledge allowed us to design a selection scans in the data set. So we took uh, two different approaches. First, we scanned for excess differentiation by FST in such a quartet design to get rid of a very local selection events, which wouldn't be a ploid informative. And the other approach was a fine math which searches for the differentiated amino acids, which are also uh, predicted to be functionally uh, important. So the change uh, would be functionally uh, relevant. And using these two um, methods, we identified a 229 genes, which would be uh, candidate genes for adaptation to whole genome duplication in Cardamine Amara. 
and they suggest a polygenic response to whole genome duplication involving a DNA maintenance, the evolution of stress response and signaling, and ion homeostasis. Here you can see examples of the pattern of differentiation in some of the loci. Uh, to be able to compare this to uh, Arabidopsis arenosa, we use the same selection scanning um, procedure for arenosa and identified 450 uh, genes which would be adapted uh, candidates uh, to adaptation to whole genome duplication. We managed to um, retrieve also the results from meiosis. All eight uh, meiosis loci were included in the list. And then we looked for the overlap. And actually, out of the two candidate gene lists, only six genes overlapped, which is a non-significant level of um, overlap. And it suggests a very limited gene level convergence. And none of the uh, nicely differentiated meiosis genes from arenosa were actually um, candidate in cardamine amara. So we rejected the initial hypothesis and came up with two additional questions. So first, why there isn't any selection to this set of crossover meiosis genes in amara? Could it be that maybe uh, the meiotic behavior, the meiotic stability differs between the two species? And second, if we didn't detect any significant uh, convergence at the level of genes, could there be a convergence by function, meaning that different, uh, the same functions but different genes would be selected between the two species? So first we looked into the uh, meiotic behavior of cardamine amara. Uh, we cytologically screened the meiosis spreads uh, and assessed the stability of them. And this was done in collaboration with Terezia Mandákova from CETEC in Brno. Um, and we um, calculated uh, meiotic stability or assessed the meiotic stability as the proportion of the meiotic cells which are forming bivalence to those which are forming multivalence because they are considered unstable. And surprisingly, we found quite low degree of meiotic stability already at the deployed state, which is this box plot. And it was even lower in the tetraploids, which was somehow to be expected given the absence of selection of these crossover genes. Uh, for context, uh, I will show the results also of Arabidopsis arenosa. Uh, both diploids and tetraploids of arenosa are highly stable. Uh, actually, more than 80% of meiotic cells form bivalence. And we came up with uh, this idea how to explain uh, this low stability in cardamine amara. So cardamine amara can reproduce clonally. So it can maintain a huge population sizes by the clonal spreading. And uh, so maybe even if it has a reduced proportion or a reduced number of um, fertile gametes, it can still successfully sexually reproduce. And this would somehow decrease the need for the stabilization of meiosis already at the deployed state. And that could serve as kind of pre-adaptation to later tetraploid uh, establishment. And the second question was whether there is a convergence at the level of functional processes between uh, Amara and Arenosa. So we took two approaches how to look into this question. First, we asked whether there is overlap uh, between, the con uh, between the selected functions. For that, we, identif we, um, we analyzed the candidate gene lists by geo enrichment analysis, and we identified 22 candidate uh, functions, candidate uh, um, significantly enriched geoterms in 
uh, cardamine amara and 74 in Arabidopsis arenosa. And six of them were in the identified in both, uh, in parallel, which is a highly significant level of overlap and it provides a nice evidence that maybe there is a process level convergence between them. Second, second we looked <clears throat> sorry, into the uh, process level convergence uh, at the level of interacting protein protein uh, products. So I prepared an example of this. So imagine there is one protein selected in cardamine amara and the other one selected in Arabidopsis arenosa. And the line here uh, shows a possible predicted protein-protein uh, interaction between them. So if these two are interacting within one uh, functional category or uh, within one type of function, it's very likely they convergently contribute to the, to the same um, function, to the same process. For that, we took a protein-protein interaction from the strength database. And first of all, I asked if I take a random set of 229 genes, which would be uh, the size of the Amara gene list, how many of them would be predicted to interact with a random set of 450 genes, which would be again the size of the Arenosa gene set. And this is the distribution over 1,000 of such a runs. You can see that the highest uh, number of interaction between two candidate gene sets would be around 25. And if I looked into the real data, into the real candidate uh, gene lists, I identified 90 of co-interacting proteins. And actually, in 57 of the Amara candidates, they would interact with more than one Arenosa candidate. So this is a very strong support for the idea about the process level convergence between the two species. And you might be maybe interested what are the functions uh, or what are the processes in which uh, the candidate co-interact. The biggest cluster uh, is involved in meiosis and chromatin remodeling, but it's a different part of meiosis than the uh, well-known set of arenosa. This is the exit from meiosis and DNA repair part. And um, just to uh, maybe for you to remember, the blue um, circles show a candidate protein in cardamine amara, the gray ones in arenosa, and the lines here being a co-interaction. Co so this is a protein-protein interaction network. Uh, the other networks are involved in ion transport and ABA signaling. And uh, there is a very recent review which, are, which is nicely describing what this could mean to the functional, um, what this, what's the functional consequence of uh, these uh, networks for adaptation to whole genome duplication. So I uh, recommend it. Uh, so to summarize, um, Cardamine amara and Arabidopsis arenosa are genetically independent, but still comparable systems to study convergence in adaptation to whole genome duplication. But the, we did not if, um, identify any uh, excess gene level convergence between them. And we found a literal absence of the selection of the meiosis crossover genes in Cardamine amara, which could be uh, maybe because it's somehow pre-adapted to be able to survive and reproduce even with lower meiotic stability already at the diploid stage. And we identified uh, excess convergence 
at the level of uh, processes involving uh, genome maintenance, chromosome organization, ion transport, and APA signaling. So to conclude, it seems that the genetic basis of adaptation uh, to whole genome duplication uh, can vary quite a lot. That suggests um, minimal constraints. Um, so, and as uh, Levi Yant very nicely said in the cover letter for this project, this brings a testament to the flexibility of evolution. And we speculate that this could be a reason why so many species can successfully survive and succeed um, in the autopolyploid state. And the convergence functions which we uh, provide here might be a first, uh, might provide a first insight into the set of obligatory functions which are always need to be adapted uh, after whole genome duplication. And with this, I would like to thank um, all of my co-authors on this project, uh, Levi Jan, uh, who led it, Phil Philip Kolar, who is my PhD advisor, and also people from our team in Prague who helped. Also, if you are interested in postdoc, um, Levi Jan currently has uh, open positions, so you can check his website. Uh, I really enjoyed working with him. It was always really nice and he was very supported, supportive. And also uh, the paper uh, coming from this project is now after review in MB, so I really hope you could read more about this soon. So thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to take any questions. All right. Well, thank you for a really wonderful talk. It's a, that was wonderful, excellent work. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'm going to wait and let other folks ask theirs first. So, if, uh, as usual, if people have questions, go ahead and uh, type type in the chat box, uh, or at least just raise your hand there and, and go ahead and turn on your video and ask away. All right, well, I'm going to ask my question. How's that? <laughs> how, so how do you think, um, one thing I, I think about when I look at this work is is the sort of role that recurrent polyploid formation might play in the evolution of meiotic stability. So you can imagine if you have multiple origins of these polyploids that you sort of keep potentially having to re-evolve re uh, some of the, the adaptation to genome duplication itself that, that occurs post-polyploidy. Post do you think that um, the age or the number of rounds, of, the number of origins of cardamony and uh, arenosa differ here? Or is this, uh, yeah, sort of what, what, what do you think about that in this particular case? Do you, do you think that plays any role? So the evidence we have for, for the species uh, which I presented here, which is arenosa lirata and amara, uh, suggests more oh, like sorry. a- no, no, amara. <laughs> Uh, I just spoke, sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> completely fine. I understood. So it suggests uh, a single origin of the tetraploids. But I think if there is this uh, recurrent rounds, uh, the tetraploids would later be able to hybridize together and exchange uh, the possibly adaptive alleles in the same way as right. they did in Arenosa and Lirata. At least that's right. my intuition from this cool. system. All right, uh, uh, David Gopeshi, uh, do you consider, oh, go ahead, David, turn on your your video and go, feel free to ask that. Okay, hello. so do you consider? Uh, hello, Magdalena, uh, nice Hi. talk. Uh, I, I just wonder if you, if you can explain us if you consider asexual reproduction as a consequence of lower meiotic pairing or is it is it vice versa? Is it that uh, the lower meiotic pairing actually forced the, the, the plant species uh, to start pro, to, to produce asexually? Mm -hmm. So I, I hope by asexual in this, uh, in this respect, you mean the clonal spreading 
And yes. we know that uh, Amara is already uh, planning, uh, spreading clonally at a deployed state. So I expect that first it somehow could cope with the lower um, uh, lower proportion of proper gametes by the clonal spreading, and then it use it later uh, to be able to adapt or to to survive at the polyploid state. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Actually, uh, the diploids and tetraploids of Amara are completely, like phenotypically, they are um, completely the same. You can recognize what ploid they, you are looking at. All right, Pat, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Yes, terrific talk, Magdalena. Um, Thank you. We're hearing quite a lot more and more about, about genome dominance recently in the, in the hybrids. And I'm trying to match what we hear about that, which could be epigenetic or could be more, more to, to it of the packaging of the chromatin. And how does that fit with the convergence models that, that you, you have and what you are seeing with, with, with respect um, to the, the, the genetic constraints of the two different parents in the tetraploids? Mm -hmm. So thank you for this question. So these are autotetraploids, meaning that they originated within species yeah. and uh, uh, all four of the homologous chromosomes should be like equally uh, uh, co completely comparable. There shouldn't be any like uh, genome dominance of one parent over the other. Um, and that's also why you need to somehow solve the problems with meiosis so much, because if you have four completely comparable chromosomes, which can pair in any possible way, uh, it's really difficult to force them to form only bivalence and not multivalence. But in in terms of adaptation, well, um, you yeah, just I, 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 I yeah obvi obviously appreciate what exactly what what you're saying. But could there be some sort of a, a dominance in, uh, that's equivalent to the exist system in uh, the mammals with the suppression of the X chromosome? Uh. I'm not sure if I understand. Okay, so well, obviously in the female you have one, one of the X's is, is repressed, um, despite both both normal both being being usually usually there. Could there be some sort of a, a parallel as to how one genome is is suppressed in the autotetraploid? I'm not. Ever can, of the, there be any epigenetic, can there be any epigenetic proteins that are involved? So, uh, I'm yeah. not aware of any suppression of uh, of a no, part of a genome that. in order to stabilize in yeah. autotetraploids. Uh, but also, we did not look into the epigenetic changes. So okay. maybe I can't tell you much about that. Okay, that would I know would certainly be, be interesting if, the, if there were any any genome wide suppress, suppression effects either either with, with DNA or associated proteins. I'm afraid I can can no, answer thanks, to that. Thanks. Good, uh, good. Well, great talk. Thank you. All right. Well. Yeah, that was a wonderful talk. Really, I find this all of this work to be just really, really exciting, uh, and I look forward to reading the paper when it comes out. Um, Thank you. Well, with that, we'll transition to our our uh, next speaker uh, for our second talk of the hour. And if there are any other questions that folks think of for Megalino while um, the next speaker is going, uh, save those, and we'll have a chance to ask them at the end. All right. So uh, our next speaker, uh, who's loading up slides right now, all right, uh, is uh, our next speaker is, is Merrick Glombic. Uh, Merrick is a, a PhD candidate at Maastricht University in Brno uh, uh, in the PhD in the graduate program on genomics and proteomics. Uh, and he is doing most of his research at the Institute of Experimental Botany at Olomouc. Uh, he focuses on gene expression in plant allopolyploids and interspecific hybrids uh, with a, a focus on the grasses. 
And today he's going to talk about his latest results from uh, gene expression analyses and reciprocal festulolium grass hybrids. Uh, and the title of his talk today is Homolog Specific Gene Expression in Reciprocal Plant Hybrids. With that, I'll let Merrick take it away. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for everyone for, to, for, who joined in. And I'll start right away to, uh, with the transition from autopolyploids to allopolyploids. Uh, yeah, so we know that uh, allopolyploids are created by uh, interspecific hybridization, which is followed or preceded by whole genome duplication. And there are many economically important allopolyploids, such as wheat, cotton, all seed rape, or bananas. But what we also know is that uh, the interspecific hybridization comes with a state which is called a genomic shock, which are changes that can be observed on, on many levels in the organism, such as genome level. Uh, we can observe global methylation changes and activation of transposable elements. On the chromosome level, we can observe many meiotic irregularities, such as uh, balanced, unbalanced aneuploidy, some translocations or deletions. And on the gene level, we can observe gene loss or, or the expression changes. And as you can see on the, on the picture that I borrowed from Kevin, who had the talk uh, two weeks back, uh, there is the battle between these two genomes, which can uh, either end up with uh, one of them establishing dominance and, and contrib contributing more uh, uh, to, the, to the phenotype, or they can somehow live in, in harmony. They can, uh, they can contribute to the phenotype in like a comparable way, or they can, com they can, they can contribute to uh, specific traits. And this is also no different to our model plan, which is uh, the Festulolium hybrid. Uh, this is hybrid of uh, Festuca and Lolium, or fescues and ryegrasses. And these are widely spread grasses. And the hybrid Festulolium uh, is demanded by the breeders because it combines Festuca's tolerance against the biotic stresses, and it combines uh, Lolium's uh, better yield and nutritive qualities and palatability. But as you can see on the, on the pictures that I have, the one in the corner, uh, in, the, in this hybrid, uh, these two species, their chromosomes, uh, they pair in meiosis and they recombine which then leads to the creation of, uh, of this nice like mo mosaic of chromosomes. And as you can see, one color prevails over the other. And this was already observed uh, in 2006 by Zbyszek Zverzikowski and his team. And the, they studied the uh, eight, eight generations of Festulolium hybrids, and they studied the, uh, the chromosome content in these hybrids. And what I observed that uh, with every subsequent generation, there was a high, uh, there was a race of lolium origin chromosomes, and yeah, a low, lower number of Festuca origin chromosomes. So there was observed uh, the dominance of lolium genome on a chromosome level. And what we wanted to do, we wanted to uh, to check how it looks on the on the transcriptome level, of course. So we did RNA sequencing of, uh, of the two species, Festuca pratensis and Lolium multiflorum, and their interspecific hybrids. Uh, we went for identification of the effects of genome dominance at the expression level, which are homeolog expression bias and expression level dominance, which, are, which I'll show. And we also tested the stability and transmi transmission of the genome dominance to the next generation. Uh, so I'll show you the, on the scheme here. Uh, once again, uh, we had auto tetraploid uh, parents, uh, which were crossed to produce the hybrids, and we produced uh, reciprocal hybrids. And luckily, uh, in one of the, in one crossing direction, one plant actually gained the ability of surf fertilization, so it produced us the second generation of hybrids, which we were very happy for. And uh, we also uh, took these two generation hybrids and 
and we sequence them after four years to see uh, how the transcriptome changes uh, with age of the plant. And we also put them in cold stress to see how it, uh, how it behaves in, in the different environmental conditions. And what is uh, really important to, to mention here that all, all the plants that were sequenced, uh, they all had the full set of chromosomes of their parents. This was checked by genome in situ hybridization. So there were no homeolog recombinations in these plants that were sequenced, which could uh, introduce some differences on the expression level for us. And because we don't have a high quality reference genome uh, for our organism, we had to go the the typical uh, way for transcriptome assembly. And, and as you can uh, see on the picture, the typical pipeline uh, where you can discriminate the expression between two species is you have to map the reads uh, on the reference and then go through, through several softwares to call single nucleotide polymorphisms, which then you can use actually to, to discriminate uh, to discriminate the expression between these two species. Uh, but the problem is that uh, using one reference can introduce bias in this analysis, and it already introduces the bias on the first step where you, where you map the reads. And of course, if you don't have a high quality reference that can introduce higher bias, and if you have more distant species, that can also lead to uh, higher bias. So, yeah, what we did, we tested. Uh, we tested if we have this bias, and we took uh, the parental uh, parental RNA seq data and we mapped them to both assembled transcriptomes separately. And we just went through the through the conventional approach. And we did some uh, differential gene expression analysis, uh, which showed us the, the mapping bias caused by using individual reference transcriptome, uh, where you can see uh, on the graph on the left, uh, this is the result of where the RNA-seq data was mapped to the Festuca reference transcriptome. And we see that there is a higher number of uh, differentially expressed genes sh showing higher expression of, uh, of the Festuca parent compared to the Lolium parent. And on the other side, uh, when we mapped uh, this data to the Lolium reference transcriptome, we saw the opposite effect, which shows us that there are the bias between, uh, between these two species. And there was only, in these categories, there was only a low number of genes that were unbiased, meaning they shared uh, the same profile, whether they were mapped, whether the reads for these genes were mapped to one or the other transcriptome. Yeah, and you can see that this, uh, it, it is less than a half uh, in, the, in those categories. So what we decided to do uh, we decided to create the, to identify the species specific differences uh, in some kind of unbiased way, not using the, not using the mapping approach. And uh, this idea came out from the article of Wojciech and Weigel where they, uh, where they identified cameras in, the, in their sequencing data and and they were looking for a correlation between the abundance of camers or between the presence of camers and several phenotypes in their plants. So this led us to, to some kind of uh, <clears throat> idea that we could just uh, identify camers in the RNA-seq data between the, uh, between the parents and use these. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, we counted camers of the length 31 nucleotides, which is, which is a long enough sequence uh, to be unique and produce a reasonable amount of, of camers that we could work with. Uh, so we identified species specific camers, as you can see, there is a lot of them. Uh, but we went through, we went for camers that are discriminated by, by the SNP in the center of the sequence. And we also went through uh, other filtering steps 
uh, which would be normal for a SNP, SNP calling pipeline, such as the kamer must be homozygous in the species. And uh, if we saw a kamer with, let's say, with this nucleotide that also uh, showed some other differences in the sequence around. We also uh, we also got rid of these cameras because uh, because we didn't want any any more polymorphic regions. We just wanted these nice homozygous sequences. So in the end, we ended up with uh, over twenty six, almost twenty six and a half thousand cameras for eight thousand orthologs. So we use this basically as SNPs and we counted these cameras, we counted their abundancy in the parental and hybrid RNA-seq data. And we went through with the analysis. So first uh, we analyzed the homologue expression bias in this hybrid, uh, so, which explains the relative contribution of both homologues to the transcriptome. Uh, first, I must say, that uh, in the end, we analyzed uh, not 8,000 orthologs, but only around 6,000, uh, because these 6,000 genes were expressed in all analyzed samples. So in the reciprocal, in the aging hybrids, and in the cold stress hybrids. And we wanted to see, we wanted to see these exact genes if they're expressed in all, so we wanted to track how they behave. Uh, so, on this, uh, in the analysis of homolog expression bias, we didn't see any significant difference in preferential expression of uh, the parental alleles, but there was like a slight bias towards the Festuca alleles, Festuca allele, and this was consistent through throughout all the samples here. And when we when we checked the expression of alleles compared to the to the parental level of expression. Uh, we saw, of course, that the highest number of genes uh, retain the, the parental legacy, let's say, for the expression, with, of course, a, a high majority of genes that didn't display any significant difference, both between parents and the alleles in the hybrid. Uh, the second most abundant group was uh, was genes which display differences between parents, but in a hybrid, the bias uh, in the expression of this allele was lost. And in all the samples here, you can see a consistent pattern where there were lower number of genes uh, that had bias uh, towards Festuca allele and they lost it compared to the, to the opposite case where there were bias for lolium allele uh, and they lost it. And the other way around, uh, genes that uh, didn't display any expression bias between parents, but did display the bias in hybrids, uh, there was a lower number of genes displaying uh, uh, bias towards the lolium allele than the Festuca. It is, and this was again uh, consistent throughout all the samples that we tested. And of course, the last group, uh, which which is which consists of the lowest number of genes uh, is these that uh, display completely reversed bias in these hybrids. Um, and I forgot to show the result for the cold stress plants. So he, here they are. Um, we saw the same, basically the same pattern. Uh, as I said, it is uh, consistent throughout all the samples. Uh, but I have two types of results here. And it is because, uh, as I mentioned, the cold stress plants were also sequenced after four years. So there was also an effect of aging on these plants. Uh, so we, went, we wanted to normalize, let's say, the aging effect uh, by identifying uh, only genes that are differentially expressed between the aging plants and the stressed plants. And and we also did the we also checked the results only for those genes. And you can see there is the, there is a uh, low number uh, of these genes, not even 500 genes. Uh, but we we observed the same the same result on the homolog expression bias level. And the next, of course, uh, was uh, to analyze the expression level dominance. Uh, 
which uh, which tells us about the total level of of the expression of the gene yeah both homologs combined and of course we did uh, we did this for all the categories such as uh, additivity where in the hybrid the gene expression is some kind of uh, in some kind of median between the two parents or it is down upregulated or it doesn't change at all uh, which consists which contained uh, a lot of the genes uh, it was the highest abundant category but let's say for this presentation let's just focus on the uh, only on the genes that display lolium or festuca expression dominance uh, and that means that in the hybrid the the expression of the gene mimics mimics the expression of one of the parent and as you can see throughout throughout all the samples, except for the normalized results for cold stress, we saw the same pattern. There were a higher number of genes showing lolium expression dominance compared to the, to the number of genes displaying Festuca expression dominance. Uh, so this was, uh, again, nice consistent result. But we also did, uh, we also checked for uh, overlap of all the gene expression profiles, also those that you saw on the slide before. Uh, so we and we wanted to see if the if the genes display, yeah, the how similar the gene expression profiles are uh, in the other hybrids. So we saw that between the reciprocal hybrids, there was a huge overlap of over eighty percent of genes. So these genes behave kind of in the same way, uh, no matter the crossing direction. Whereas when you take a look at the first and second generation uh, of the hybrids, there was just a there was lower overlap, overlap only about sixty percent, which actually after in the hybrids sequence after four years it grew a bit about seven percent, so that can uh, that can hint some kind of gradual stabilization of the gene expression profiles, and. The last one was, uh, of course, the cold stress plants, which showed, uh, which showed the overlap of eighty-five percent, which is good. That shows us that they they react in a very similar way to the cold stress, which, uh, of course, they should. Uh, but also to get the full picture, uh, we had to let's say cross cross link the results from the homolog expression bias excuse me and the uh, and the expression level dominance uh, so we took at the uh, at the allele expression of the genes that were in these categories and this is the result from this are consistent with uh, with what was shown in other species such as cotton and brassicas and that is that uh, uh, it, uh, in the category where one genome is dominant, uh, it regulates the expression by regulating the submissive allele. As you can see uh, in here, uh, where, where in this category, the hybrid displays uh, the lolium expression dominance. Uh, and in most of the genes, the uh, Festuca allele was upregulated to get to this uh, uh, expression level, and the same goes for the uh, for the result uh, for Festuca uh, expression dominance. Uh, in here, the lolium allele was upregulated, but it was not upregulated as efficiently uh, as lolium. Yeah, you can see that uh, the percent the percentage is lower. Even though this is not uh, this is not like a huge huge number of genes uh, that that show this pattern, but this could tell us that uh, yeah that that one of the parents is more efficient in the uh, in the regulation of uh, of the gene expression th than the other one. And yeah, so so we tested also for the for the cis and trans regulatory divergence. Uh, uh, where you can see on the on the picture that I that I borrowed uh, all the possible scenarios of the regu regulatory divergence, uh, either cis regulatory divergence, which have an allele specific effect on the expression, so caused by 
by genetic variants on the same DNA molecule, or, or the trends, uh, regulatory divergence. And this can influence expression of both homologs because these influence uh, diffusible elements. Uh, these are caused by diffusible elements such as transcription factors. Uh, uh, so you can see that uh, it, it, how the relative, uh, relative expression would look uh, for genes that we would find in these categories. And these two regulatory divergence uh, mechanisms can also actually uh, let's say go together and promote the expression of one allele, or they can go against each other. That one promotes expression of uh, the allele from one parent, uh, and the other mechanism promotes the expression of the second parent. So then we would have this kind of result for the relative expression between the alleles. And we saw a highly, uh, highly consistent uh, result for this. Uh, in the terms that uh, we we saw a higher higher number of genes uh, in each category in the second generation of hybrids, except except for uh, for the genes showing cis only regulation pattern for uh, for let's say the, the two two samples, but overall uh, this was again consistent throughout every category, and there were also genes. Uh, uh, falling, uh, actually the highest number of genes falling in a compensatory category, which I forgot to mention. And this is a category where uh, these genes are influenced by both cis and trans regulatory mechanisms, uh, but there is no uh, significant difference in their expression in the hybrid. So they kind of compensate each other. Yeah. Uh, so to quickly just conclude this, uh, we implemented uh, a KMER approach to, uh, to identify single nucleated polymorphisms between our species and analyze the differential gene expression from the RNA-seq data. And we observed genome dominance of lolium uh, at the expression level dominance level. And, and we saw a bias for Festuca at the homeolog expression bias level. Uh, and we observed the stability of these uh, of these two effects of genome dominance, uh, no matter the crossing direction, the, the generation of hybrids, age, which we saw the, the gradual stabilization of the gene expression profiles and the environmental conditions, which would be the cold stress. So uh, let me just say a quick thank you to, uh, to David, who, who, who's my supervisor. And, and all the other colleagues from the Institute, uh, also Bruno and Dario from ETH, Tom from the Institute for Ag Agricultural and Fisheries Research, Martin from Palatsky University, Zbyszek from the Institute of Gen for Genome Research in Poznan, uh, and Jonathan also from Iowa State University. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for listening, for tuning in, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you for a really wonderful talk, Merrick. Uh, as always, if there are any questions, feel free to post them in the chat box or uh, raise your hand and we'll fire up your email or your audio and video and uh, you can ask those though. Well, I have a real quick question while we're waiting on uh, some other folks to formulate their questions. Do you, do you see any difference um, in uh, genes that are uh, targeted at the cytoplasm, sort of the cytoplasmic interaction here with uh, these patterns of expression? Or is that, Justin, was that your, your question? I see you just popped on. <laughs> Yeah, that's going to be, be my exact question, but go ahead. I'll, I'll, you, let, you, I'll let you ask that away. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was more curious about the reciprocal F1 uh, expression, <clears throat> because one of the big differences in, in those plants would be the, the uh, cytoplasm, the mitochondria and chloroplasts that could regulate the nuclear genes. And so I wonder if you, you know, dug into those 15% that don't share similar patterns between the two reciprocal hybrids uh, and see if there's any, you know, cytonuclear effects. 
Yeah, I, I didn't really like uh, dug in deeply, uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, you're right. I, I did check for uh, for some genes which are uh, which are in these cy cytonuclear interactions and and yeah, uh, let's say when we would be talking about the genes like from uh, from the organelles. Uh, there was the clear maternal effect, yeah. Uh, so, so that the, these genes would be expressed from uh, from the from the species that was uh, used as the mother for the crossing. Uh, but I did check for the other genes that are encoded by by the nuclear genome, and yeah, they were more or less. The, there was no, let's say, any an, any clear pattern for these. Cool, thank you. And, and fantastic job, by the way, too. I have a, another a quick question well, uh, that I'll ask that the, so, so for the genes that are, do, uh, do you have a sense of for the genes where you see switching of uh, the expression bias, do you, um, do you, get a sense, uh, is it possible that, you know, some of these might be uh, genes that have picked up deleterious substitutions or other sorts of um, uh, uh, knockouts or other kinds of things that have happened in the, in the, in the polyvoids and so that you've got down regulation of expression possibly because of the, you know, these flips in expression because of those sorts of uh, substitution or other kind of mutagenic phenomena that might have happened after the polyploidy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, know exactly what you mean. Uh, the yeah, it might be, uh, it might be some, some, uh, it might be caused epigenetically. But the, uh, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't look at the, uh, we didn't look at the methylation pattern, so I, I wouldn't be uh, able to answer that. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think you actually summed it up pretty pretty well in your question. It can be, yeah, it can it can be ca caused by this. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, any other questions for uh, Merrick today, or Magdalena? As uh, uh, had a little more time to digest all the talks. All right. Well, if not, I'd like to thank both uh, Magdalena and Merrick for two wonderful talks today. Uh, these are really great. Uh, and it's great to see all the exciting work that both of you are doing at this early stage in your careers. Uh, re really, uh, really wonderful. And um, I look forward to seeing the, the next generation set of work, the next the follow ups to these studies as well. Um, and I just want to uh, let folks know that uh, in two weeks on March 29th, we'll have a, our next uh, polyploid webinar. Uh, and in two weeks, that'll be a day of unreduced gametes. So Julia Kreiner and Beth, uh, Ben Gerstner will uh, both present uh, uh, empirical and theoretical work on uh, unreduced gametes and, uh, and polyploid formation. Uh, and so uh, join us if you have an interest in unreduced gametes and bring all those questions about uh, the origins and, uh, of polyploid species. All right. Uh, with that, uh, I just uh, want to thank everybody for uh, showing up today. and. Uh, we'll see everyone in two weeks. All right, bye, folks. <laughs>